Good morning, church family. Thank you for two of you that answered. Great. Um, it's, it's always a joy to be able to come and share God's word with you, and this morning is no exception. If you have a copy of God's word, and I pray that you don't have any reason not to, because we gave one to you in, in the pew rack in front of you if you don't, uh, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Um, one of the passions that God has given me is a passion for, for languages and learning etymology, the root of words, and it's, it's neat to see how words change meanings over time. Uh, for example, when I say the word awful, what do you think of? Something that's bad. Would you be surprised if I told you that the word awful originally was a synonym with awesome? It meant the same thing. See, in, in the mid-1700s, the, the root word awe, A-W-E, meant a solemn and reverential wonder, tinged with fear, but inspired by the sublime in nature, such as thunder or a storm at sea. It's, it's, it's incredible. It's, it's, it's a little fearful, but it, it's full of awe. So it is awful. Um, as time went by in the mid-19th century, the word awful was no longer a synonym with awesome because it adopted the negative concept of that attitude, of that emotion. And so now we know awful is something that is, is frightful or exceedingly bad. Well, in the passage we're going to talk about today in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, there's one word that repeats itself five times in these three, three verses, and it's the word reconciliation, either the noun form reconciliation or the verb reconciled. And that word in Greek went through a similar transition. See, the word in Greek is katalaso, which literally means an exchange of one thing for another. And it was used in the marketplace where they would say they would exchange money or coins for other coins of equal value, or maybe they would exchange money for an object. And it was an exchange. But as the years went by, the word ceased to mean exchange so much, and they replaced it with reconcile. But the meaning didn't change because, you see, in reconciliation, someone who's at enmity is now replaced with peaceful relations. So reconciliation, exactly that. And for the Greeks, the person, two people who are opposed, then became reconciled. They became at peace with each other. And this is the main idea in, Paul's, in, Paul, in the section of Paul's passage that we're going to talk about today in verses 18 through 20. Um, last week, Pastor David Miller spoke about the, the ingredients of reconciliation among others in the body of Christ. But as we go into verse 18 and ending the chapter, Paul focuses more now on our reconciliation with God the Father. So if you have your Bibles, open to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Let's read verses 18 through 20 this morning. The Holy Spirit says this through the Apostle Paul. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. So reconciliation. And as we work through these three verses, I think Paul gives us some key concepts so we can understand what reconciliation is and how it works. And first in your outline, we see the author of reconciliation. The author of reconciliation. If, as it is, this is one of the key ideas in this passage, um, we need to understand so what, why is reconciliation a necessity? Why even talk about it? Because you see that the word reconciliation implies a, a ruptured relationship. It implies alienation or, or disaffection. So the, one of the reasons why we need reconciliation, letter A in your outline, is because of our iniquity. It's because of us. It, our relationship with God was broken when we, when we sinned. And it was, it was us, we are the ones who ran away from God, not the other way around. See, God is perfect, we are not. God does not need to change, God does not need to make concessions, God does not need to find some middle ground of cooperation with us. No, 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 we, we need to change. It is, it is our sin that separates us from God. It is our sin that makes us enemies of God. And what's more is that not only is it our sin that separates from him, but we don't even seek after God. 
The Bible tells us that in Romans 3, 10 and 11, where it says, there is none righteous, no, not one. It said, no one understands, no one seeks God. So in a little parenthesis, when we hear about seeker-friendly or seeker-sensitive churches, beware. Because when we have a place where we're trying to appease people, make them feel good about themselves, we're not going to speak the truth about the reality of sin. And if you don't address the reality of sin, you cannot fully understand the truth of the gospel. Those who are seeking God are those in whom the Holy Spirit has already begun to convict them of their sin and their need for a savior. Those who seek God are those who the Father is already drawing them to, your, to, the, to his side. And friend, maybe this morning you're feeling, you, you're, you're outside of Christ, and maybe you're feeling, well, I feel something. Well, that's the Holy Spirit. Respond to that. You can seek God because God is already seeking after you. But in terms of reconciliation, the only thing we bring to the table in reconciliation is our sin, our iniquity that requires it. You see, reconciliation is because of our iniquity, but it's God's initiative. So who is the author of reconciliation? Well, it tells us right here in verse 18, it's God. And look how verse 18 begins. All this is from God. All, all what? Well, in context, look at verses prior to that. It talks about being a new creation in Christ. It talks about salvation, redemption, reconciliation, the life that we have because of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. All of this salvation, being able to be reconciled to God, it all begins with God. It begins with him. The picture of, in the Bible is never one of, of man seeking after God. It's always the opposite. It's God who's reaching down and seeking after man. Look, for example, in, in Romans chapter five, verse eight. Many of us know this verse. In Romans 5, eight, it says, but God shows his love toward us and that when we got our act together, Christ died for us. Are we reading the same Bible? That's not in my Bible. That was a test. But God chose his love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jump down to verse 10, same chapter. For if while we were enemies, we, have been now, uh, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. So we were enemies of God, we were sinners, and God took the initiative to reconcile us to himself. You see, God made a way of reconciliation when there was no other way. And always in the word of God, when it talks about reconciliation, it's not talking about something that, that we do or we strive for. It's something that God provides and we receive by faith. So the question is this morning for some of you is, have you been reconciled to God? Have you received reconciliation? We'll talk a little more about what that means. At the end of verse 18, it has this phrase that God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that when we get down to verse 20. Um, so stay, tu stay, stay tuned for that. But for now, the word ministry here is the word diakonia, which in Greek means service. Um, we're, it reminds us of deacons, diakonos. So really the word picture here is someone who prepares the table who sets the table. If you're having guests over for dinner, you prepare the table. So in a sense, those of us who have received reconciliation from God, those of us who are believers, our ministry, our service, is to prepare the table for others to taste and see that God is good. So God is the author of reconciliation. But then we see the agent of reconciliation in verse 19. Look at verse 19 again with me. It says that that is, talking about the ministry of reconciliation. What is reconciliation? That is that in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. Now hold on just a second at that point. I, I hope that as you and I study the word of God and begin to understand more about God's character of who he is and who we are, I hope we see a problem with that passage. I, so much so that I even put it on your outline so we would see it. But before we get to your outlines, let me, say, let me put it this way. The biggest problem in the universe, the biggest problem with humanity is this. Are you ready? 
God is good. And you know your raised eyebrows speak a lot, don't they? Your raised eyebrows said, but Peter, I thought you said this was a problem. Oh, oh, it is a problem. You see, that's only half of it. God is good, but you are not. I am not. So what does a good God do with somebody like me? I know what I deserve. I put it this way on your outline for our problem. The first point of that, Roman number, uh, number one, is that we are sinners. Help me out. What does Romans 3.23 say? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But not only are we all sinners, but our sin is what condemns us to hell. What I deserve for my sin is God's wrath poured out over my life and over my eternity. Listen to what Isaiah 59 verse two says. It says, but your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God and your sins have hidden his face from you so he will not hear. Ezekiel 18 verse four says that the soul who sins shall die. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin, what you and I deserve for our sin is death. That, that, that's who we are, and that's a problem, but the problem is even compounded more by the second thing on your outline is that God is holy and just. We sang it this morning, Isaiah 6, 3, Revelation 4, 8, said that God is holy, holy, holy. He's a holy God, separated from sin. Deuteronomy 32, verse four says that the rock, talking about God, his work is perfect for all his ways are justice. A God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and upright is he. But then we get to verse 19 that we just read. And it says that God is reconciling the world to himself. We'll get back to that phrase in a second. By not counting their trespasses against them. How, how can God do that? Romans 3.25, and we're gonna read the passage in, in a minute, but Romans 3.25 says, part of that says, because in his divine forbearance, he has passed over former sins. Do you see the problem with that? See, if God is holy and just, and he is, how can he ignore or pass over sin? That's not being just. We wouldn't say that if, if an earthly judge would go into a courtroom, we see, we see a criminal there and said, yep, you're guilty. But you know what? Today I'm gonna pass over your, your offense. You can go free. Would he say he's a competent judge? Would, he, would we say he's a just judge? No. And yet we praise God for forgiving or ignoring or passing over sin. H how is that possible? You see the problem, right? And it is a problem, but it has an answer. And the answer is letter B on your outline. It's Christ's provision. Christ's provision. Turn with me to Romans chapter three. We quoted verse 23 a moment ago. But Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And praise God that the passage does not end there because look how it keeps on going in verse 24. And are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness in, uh, because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at this present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Christ's provision, provision according to Romans 3.25 is the word propitiation, propitiation. You say, now what kind of word is that? Well, I'm glad you asked. So let me give you a working definition of propitiation. But before that, tune into Beyond the Notes this week because we are going to dive in more deeply about what propitiation is and why is it important to the Christian life. But for now, this is what propitiation is. It is a sacrifice that appeases or satisfies God's holy wrath against sin. It's a sacrifice that, that appeases or that, that satisfies God's holy wrath against sin. One Bible commentator said it this way, propitiation is a sacrifice that bears God's wrath to the end and in so doing changes God's wrath toward us into favor. 
So once again, there's our reconciliation. It's exchanging one thing for another. It's propitiation is a sacrifice that bears out the weight of God's wrath over sin. And when we believe on him, he exchanges that into favor. You see, because of our sin and rebellion, our original communion and fellowship with God has been broken. And what you and I deserve for that sin is nothing less than hell. It's God's wrath. You see, in the Bible, God's wrath is an expression of his holiness in the face of our sin. God cannot show us love and mercy, even though God is a God of infinite love. He cannot show us love and mercy at the expense of his justice. God doesn't just hide the fact that he's a just and holy God in order to, in order to forgive our sins. He needs to demand, his justice demands that our sins are paid for. And my friend, if you're outside of Christ, the only way that you can pay for your sins is to die and for an eternity suffer in hell. And that is what I deserve for my sins. And God's justice demands that sin be paid for. And in his love, he gave us Christ. He sent Christ, his only son, and Christ's death on the cross satisfies God's just wrath for my sin. Hebrews 2.17 says, therefore, talking about Christ, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. That's God's love on display for you. So much so that 1 John 4.10 says it this way, in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that God loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. You see, God didn't all of a sudden become soft and just start handing out get out of hell free cards. No, our trespasses in the, our trespasses in the weight of them, the, the gravity of our trespasses, the wrath that is due them was poured out on Christ on the cross. So that because of Christ's death and resurrection, God's justice is no longer excused, it's no longer put aside, but it's justified. It is satisfied. Christ's propitiation. But not only his provision, um, that allows us to accept God's promise. Let us see in your outline. And God's promise is justification. Turn with me to Colossians chapter one. In Colossians one, we see another verse where the word reconcile appears in the New Testament. There are several others we won't get to today. But Colossians 1.19 says, for in him, in Christ, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile, there's our word again, all things to himself, all things, whether on, on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you who, for, who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death. In order to, now that phrase in order to, what does that mean? Here at grammar students, where are you? In order to means there's a purpose. There's the, with the result of what? In order to present you holy and blameless, and above reproach before him. That's justification. It's declaring you holy and blameless above reproach. We read this verse in Romans 3, 26, so that God, through the propitiation of Christ's sacrifice on the cross, might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So what is, quickly, justification? Well, justification is the act by which through the atoning work of Jesus Christ on the cross, God declares a sinner to be holy and just or righteous and just and then treats him or her as righteous or just. You know, it would be, it would be enough for God to just declare us to be righteous because of what Christ did on the cross and yet show us no blessing later in life just not give us hell and we win heaven for us and, and we would have reason to praise him. But God didn't stop there. He justifies us and part of that is declaring us righteous but then the other part is treating us as though we were righteous. It would be like a judge who when, he, when the sentence has been paid by someone else in this case, he can declare the criminal innocent and then he invites him over for dinner and dessert. 
See, God does not, does not only want to justify you. He wants that, that justification to begin a process of having a personal relationship with you. And the reason, the only reason that God can justify us, declaring us as just and righteous and treating us as though we're just and righteous is because on the cross, God declared Jesus to be sin and treated him as though he were sin in our place. Come back next Sunday because we're going to talk more about that. So stay tuned. Really quickly at the beginning of verse 19, let me get back to this phrase before we go on to verse 20. It says that God was reconciling the world to himself. Now let me tell you what that does not mean first. This does not mean that all the world is going to be reconciled to God and be saved one day. This is not a universalist salvation statement. If you remember last week, if you were here, Pastor David talked about the word all that appeared three times in verses 14 and 15 and explained how as we go through the study of 2 Corinthians, words must be defined by context and interpreted by the whole counsel of God's will. And in these contexts, we see very clearly what the Puritan Thomas Watson wrote about this verse. He says that Christ's blood has value enough to redeem the whole world, but the virtue of it is applied only to such as believe. So once again, do you believe? Have you been reconciled to God because of what Christ did on the cross? Was there a moment in your life where you repented of your sin, you, you forsook your sin, and you placed your faith and trust in the finished work of Christ on the cross? If you haven't, today can be your day. Today can be the day that you experience salvation, redemption, forgiveness of sin, reconciliation with God. Don't leave today without knowing how you can do that. God is definitely the author of salvation. And we see very clearly that Christ is the agent of reconciliation. But then we get to verse 20, and we're reminded that we are the ambassadors of reconciliation. Right after high school, um, I went to go to Bible school in Argentina in the Instituto Bíblico Palabra de Vida in the pueblo de San Miguel del Monte, poco fuera de Buenos Aires. Got all that? Great. A couple of you did. I went to Word of Life Bible, Bible Institute uh, in a town called San Miguel del Monte. It's just a little bit outside of Buenos Aires. Uh, and as a U.S. citizen, uh, I had to go with a religious visa to, in order to study. And while we were going to school, one of our fellow classmates, another U.S. citizen, lost his passport. Now, if you ever, guys ever go out of the country, do not lose your passport. It is not a fun ordeal to go through. Just a word to the wise. Don't lose your passport. Um, so a couple of us... Uh, accompanied him to Buenos Aires, to the capital, to where the U.S. Embassy is. Um, and as we're walking up to the embassy, because we got off the bus a few blocks away, and you walk up, you can tell we're in Argentina. You go through a little plaza, and there's people saying, hey, che, como andas? And you, you, you go over a little cart, and you can buy some choripan con chimichurri. Oh, it's so good. Don't talk about food before lunch. I'm getting hungry. And everything is, is clearly Hispanic. It's in Spanish. But then you walk through the doors of the embassy and everything changes. It's, hey man, how you doing? You see the game last night? You have people wearing baseball caps on in Argentina. You see, because the, the, em, the embassy and the ambassador who sort of serves in the embassy helps us realize that, that he, although residing in Argentina, is not a part of Argentina. There's a purpose and today, the current U.S. Amb US ambassador in Argentina is Mark Stanley. Um, this wasn't the same person that was there when I was there. But Mark Stanley's official title, this is just, this is just fun, a fun fact for later, is the Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary of the United States of America to the government of the Argentine Republic. That's his title. I would love to see his business card. It's got me too. Uh, but he's an, he, he, he's an ambassador. And as an ambassador, Mark Stanley does not speak to please the Argentine government. He speaks to please the President of the United States who sent him. As an ambassador, Mark Stanley does not speak on his own authority. You know, his own opinions and demands, demands matter very little. He says that which he has been instructed and commissioned to speak. 
And although he is a messenger, Mark Stanley is also a representative of the United States, meaning the, the honor and the reputation of the United States of America rests in his hands as a representative of his country. And although he resides in Buenos Aires, Mark Stanley is never going to become a citizen of Argentina because his primary goal is to remain faithful to, to represent well, and to speak the words of the country where his citizenship lies. Philippians 3.20 tells us that our citizenship is where? It's in heaven. So look at verse 20. We, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. You see that first phrase, we are ambassadors. Now that is descriptive. It is declarative. It is not imperative. Now what's an imperative? It's a command. Look what your Bible does not say. It does not say, therefore, be ambassadors for Christ. It does not say, therefore, we should strive to become ambassadors. We ought to be. No. We are, if, if you are believing in Jesus Christ, you are an ambassador. This is our identity. This is who we are in Christ. So the question is not, well, I probably should be an ambassador. You know, should I be? No. The Bible tells us very clearly you are an ambassador. So the question is for you, child of God, are you an effective ambassador for Christ? Are you a faithful ambassador for Christ? At the beginning of the service, we were reminded of our purpose statement. And this is one of the measures of that purpose statement. Remember what it says. It says, by God's grace, we desire to glorify God by magnifying his word to develop disciples who think biblically, live missionally, give generously, and love sacrificially. Live missionally. Live as ambassadors. And although we reside here on earth, our citizenship is not here. We are all foreign aliens on this planet. It says that God makes his appeal through us. You and I are the mouthpiece of God. In strategic places where he has placed you, in your home, in your neighborhood, at your school, at your workplace, on the golf course, in your sewing club, if any of you are part of a sewing club, wherever you are, God has placed you there so he can make an appeal through you. And many of you might say, but Peter, I don't, I don't, I don't like the situation I'm in. My, my circumstances are very hard. I don't know why God has me here. I, I'm afraid to share my faith because what, what, what will people do? What will they say? Let me encourage you with two things. First, is God sovereign? Not a trick question. He is. He is sovereign. Is God wise? Yes. I'm glad two people know the answer. Now all of you know. He is sovereign. He is wise. So in his, his wise sovereignty, God has strategically placed you where he wants to best use you in this chapter in life to be his emissary, to be his voice. I don't like the fact that you're going through a difficult time, some of you. And I wish I could change some of that. But in his sovereignty, God has allowed you to be where he's placed you so that you and I would be faithful ambassadors for Christ, speaking and appealing on behalf of the Lord. And secondly, you aren't, you aren't the only person who sometimes struggles with being a faithful ambassador. The only other time the word ambassador appears in scripture is in a, in a prayer that Paul shares in Ephesians chapter six, verses 19 and 20. Paul says this, and pray also for me that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that I might declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Paul asked the church in Ephesus to pray for him that he would be bold in his ambassadorial role. Oh church, may we be found faithful and bold ambassadors for Christ. So that is our ministry. The last phrase of verse 20 is our message. The message, our message as ambassadors. It says, we implore you then, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to God. That's our message. That's the gospel. This is it. 
This morning, my brother and sister in Christ, if you're a believer in Christ, what would it look like as you think of the people who God has sovereignly placed across in your, in your path this week? What would it look like if instead of seeking after our own comfort, instead we sought after reaching souls for Christ? What if instead of investing and accumulating more trinkets and commodities, it's not necessarily bad, but instead we were committed to investing in that which matters for eternity, where our citizenship lies? What if instead of living for our own agenda, we would actually live missionally as ambassadors for the glory of God here as his emissaries? Think of how that would change your community. Think of how that would change us here at McGregor. And my dear friend, if you are here today and you're not yet a believer, if you're outside of Christ, if you're hearing my voice, whether because you're here present or because you're listening to this later on, although I myself am absolutely nothing, but as an ambassador for Christ, I implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to God. Realize that it's your sin that demands God's wrath. And I don't have to convince you you're a sinner. You already know that. Because if you could have cleaned up your life by now, you would have already. You know your sin. And God knows it too. And may you see that your sin condemns you to spend an eternity in hell apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. But God in his mercy, not at the expense of his justice, sent his son Jesus Christ as the propitiation, the sacrifice that appeased and satisfied God's holy wrath against your sin. And he died on the cross of Calvary. He died in your place so that you could be declared just and righteous, so you could be forgiven of your sins and be reconciled to God when you repent, forsake your sins, and trust in the work, in the person, the sacrifice, the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ.